study of patients has been fundamental to developing our understanding of how memory works. I suppose it's like, you know, in, in much of biology we study errors as a way of learning about normal function. And it's the same in neuropsychology, it's the same in neuroscience. That we, we, by studying errors, the, this gives us a window into the organization of normal function. And that's how patients, so the patients have been especially valuable for uh, the cognitive structure, understanding the cognitive structure of, of things, because it's, you can carry out this sophisticated testing with them. They've also been helpful for the anatomy, but of course, you know, nature doesn't honor the anatomical boundaries that exist in the brain, so although the patient work will give us strong hints and strong clues about what the important structures are, it's really been the following up of those insights, of, those, this, of the patient work with experimental animals where direct interventions can be made carefully, where the, where the real confirmations have come about what the important anatomy is. The patients come to us from a variety of different uh, sources and causes. Um, HM, of course, was an N of one. And when this was an experimental neurosurgery for epilepsy, and when it was discovered that the tragic effects of the surgery on memory, it, this, it wasn't repeated. Um, but very similar lesions, very similar damage to HMs can be caused by encephalitis, the viral encephalitis. The virus attacks the brain um, it's not understood very well why it attacks certain places and certain parts. It tends to attack, attack the front part of the brain more than the back. Sometimes it'll attack the frontal lobe. Sometimes it'll attack the basal forebrain. But in some of the patients that we've had the chance to study, it's attacked bilaterally the medial surface of the temporal lobe. And exactly why the virus should seek out those areas isn't understood at all. But we have patients that we've had a chance to study where their MRI looks extraordinarily similar to HM's, HM's lesion. So that's one kind of patient. There's a, two other common sources of, of memory impairment. One comes from patients who suffer an anoxic event of respiratory distress or <clears throat> loss of oxygen for a period of time, or an ischemic event where they've lost blood flow to the brain for a period of time. Now, of course, if the anoxia or the ischemia goes on for too long, there's generalized brain damage. But if the, if the interruption only goes on for a few minutes, or several minutes, 10 minutes, let's say, then one can find isolated damage to the hippocampus. The hippocampus seems to be the area of the brain most sensitive to oxygen distress, respiratory distress. And that seems to be because the, uh, the hippocampus has a device known as the NMDA receptor. And the AMDA receptor is very sensitive to overexciting, over, over being overexcited. Some people like to say that what the NMDA receptor has done for the hippocampus is created the possibility of making fast, rapid changes. It's a, there's a mechanism there that allows rapid synaptic change that's built around the NMDA receptor. And you could almost say that building a device like that that can change so quickly and change the synaptic strength so quickly you've built in the seeds of its destruction at the same time. So the, the same mechanism is, is vulnerable to overexcitability. And the overexcitability can lead to then cell death, firing, overexciting, over and then eventually killing the cells. And that seems to be what happens with anoxia. The cells are overexcited, and over a period of time, the cells die. And you end up with a, a loss of hippocampal volume, and on histology, a, a, a death of the cells in the hippocampus. So that would be a, another case. And then the, the final uh, source of memory impairment that has been studied a lot come, is something known as Korsakoff syndrome. Uh, Korsakoff was a Russian psychiatrist who, in 1887, described the, this condition uh, of memory loss. And it's usually associated with uh, uh, extreme alcoholism or Alcohol, al uh, periods of alcoholism that are so extreme w that there's di uh, malnutrition, particularly loss of thiamine. <clears throat> and this condition leads to a characteristic pattern of damage, not in the hippocampus actually, but in the midline part of the brain, in the thalamus and hypothalamus. And that, those characteristic lesions 
uh, also lead to a memory impairment that's very similar to the memory impairment associated with medial temporal lobe damage. Yeah, it's a puzzle as to why we have these, there's two areas of the brain where damage can cause a memory impairment, and it's been studied in some detail, and they really do look pretty similar to each other. Although in Korsakoff syndrome, one often has uh, frontal damage in addition to the memory impairment. So there can be some features of, of cognitive impairment superimposed on the memory deficit, but the core memory deficit itself appears very similar. Nobody really has a good idea as to why that is, but w those of us who have thought about it and talked about it uh, have suggested that um, one thing you need to do with a memory structure is translate memory into action. And if you're going to translate anything into action, you have to get to the frontal lobe. And if you're going to get to the frontal lobe, you have to go through the thalamus, because the thalamus is the gateway to the cortex. So there are projections from the medial temporal lobe into the thalamus, the anterior nucleus, of the thalamus and the dorsal medial nucleus of the thalamus, and these are structures that are damaged in Korsakoff syndrome. So it could just be th that, uh, that these structures that are damaged in Korsakoff syndrome are the next structures in line in working with memory, in, in this case, moving memory towards action. But that's uh, not a completely satisfying explanation because different parts of the brain do di usually do different, they don't do the identical thing. They're, different parts of the brain do different things, and so it's not completely satisfying as to, we don't have a good understanding of why there's this other area.